Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. You know, Walker, a number of other critics have asserted that, you know, you need to finish reading the rulebook or maybe even play the game one whole time in order to review a game. Nice no, look at the picture on the back. I I, some, I generally look at the front page of the rulebook or something to that effect, but I think it was some time ago that somebody, I think it was probably Huey, convinced me that we should probably actually play the game in its entirety, maybe even more than once to get a solid impression of it. And I have to thank him. I think that's invaluable because I think there are several games today where I'm going to say that, upon, that the second play was very illuminating and sometimes even past the second play was illuminating. But yeah, for the most part, I, I you know, reading the entire rulebook or playing the actual game, who's who's got time for that? Exactly. Fake news. Absolutely fake news. So this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We are going to talk about the games we played last week, the news and why it doesn't matter, and our feature game this week, which is Space Station Phoenix. I think it has something to do with a flaming bird in space. Like I said, I didn't actually play it. I just looked at the box. No, it's about Southwest American cities. Oh. Oh, that kind of Phoenix. Oh. Yeah. The the fake notes I made will make no sense now, but we'll go with it. I've we'll, got a whole bunch of notes about Arizona. Well, we're good then. And about how there are no space stations in Arizona. Makes it an odd name choice then. Uh, the game is a lie. So, Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, I got to show you a game called The Guild of Merchant Explorers. This is designed by Matthew Dunstan, Brett J. Gilbert, and put out by AEG Games. And it's, I don't even know what to say, it's a flip and cube game. A flip, and, <laughs> a flip and place game. So you're flipping cards. You are putting cubes out on this interesting looking map and you're spreading out. You're creating sort of blue lagoon style villages out on the map because on the next round of which there are four, you get to start from where you've put villages. You're getting ruins. You're putting out towers, all sorts of things, different scoring opportunities. It is a great little game. What did you think? I thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know how much there is there. And I agree with you that it's sort of a hybrid between a roll and write game and something along the lines of Blue Lagoon. But of course, Blue Lagoon's salient advantage is that there's actual player interaction, there's competition over resources, and the subsequent round, the, the two round structure is radically different in terms of its overall approach. I do like how Guild of Merchant Explorers builds on previous rounds. You're accumulating special powers. You're trying to stake out territory in round one so you can expand around two and then two to three and then three to four. So it's mostly linear in that sense, in a, in a, in a sort of metastasizing around the map. Uh, but as I say, I enjoyed it. It was... It was engaging. The special powers, I felt, were very swingy because you draw them in the middle of the round. And there's this very deterministic, very sort of limiting structure of the order in which the cards come out, which really rewards planning. And then the special powers throw a complete spanner into that. I don't think so much of the spanner as it throws nitro into that. <laughs> well, I didn't say the size of the spanner. It gotcha, was, gotcha. It's a spanner roughly five times the size of any of the gears. Okay. And uh, inside the, the handle of the spanner is uh, some nitro, yes. So okay. there you go. And it, it I really feel like the the victors of our game of the Guild of Merchant Explorers really won by virtue of the fact that they got the special powers they got when they needed. Like, you can look down halfway through the round and say, oh, I really used my mountain placement disadvantageously. That's unfortunate. I'm not going to get any more mountain placements this round. And then you draw the special powers and it's, oh, go to any two mountains you want and maybe some other places besides? That looks great. <laughs> and so suddenly you've just hurtled out of your problem. And it feels wonderful if you're in that position. And the powers are all fun. It's just, again, it's not something that I can take very seriously as a competitive experience, mostly by virtue of the fact that it's multiplayer solitaire and the powers just seem all over the place. But yeah, it was enjoyable. It was a clever sort of fusion between two genres, one which I very much enjoy, namely tile laying, and another I don't, which is roll and write. So I definitely preferred it more the, uh, to the latter. I didn't enjoy it nearly as much as the former. It's the kind of thing that I thought was really fun fun and cute for one play, and I don't really feel any need to go back to it. No, I, I'm right on board. I would never choose it, but I think it'd, it'd be a great game to bring in new players. Yes. People that aren't familiar with board games because it's the same cards that come up every time, and those cards that come up are fairly simple. You know, I drew a mountain, put a cube on a mountain. Not too difficult. You can even teach it as you go type thing. And even the special powers, which are ridiculous and amazing and without them the game would be awful are very it would certainly be very dry yeah they're very easy to comprehend what they do yes 
I'd be more interested in perhaps a hybrid design. I don't think this would ever happen whereby we were all placing on the same map, but all you had were the dry, simple cards that got pulled out. And therefore the excitement came from the interaction with the other players competing to get to various spots first. I, as I say, this is a very different design, what I'm positing, but the bones are there, I think, for something that would grab me more. But if you like rolling rights, if you like drawn rights uh, effectively, you know, whether whether it comes from a die or whether it comes from a deck of cards, there's not really a huge difference generally. But I will say the Guild of Merchant Explorers, unlike other drawn rights, such as Welcome To, you know that there's only the five cards in the deck and then six cards and then seven cards and then eight cards. And so there is an element of planning if the special powers don't preclude that. So yeah, It's got that interesting Karuba feel, right? Where everyone's getting the same cards at the same time, but manipulating different maps and then everyone does something slightly different, even though that the special true. powers, you know, totally lay waste to that. But mm -hmm. it's still sort of a little bit the same. And that was the Guild of Merchant Explorers. We got to play Street Masters for the first time in a long time. Street Masters, it's hard to believe that the entire lifespan of Blacklist Games as a company, because as far as I'm concerned, they're mostly kind of dead. We'll see what happens. They're definitely limping at the moment. Uh, they released Street Masters in 2018, which means about four years. So that's a pretty quick rise and fall, I think, if this is indeed their fall. Who knows? I'm not writing them off as completely dead yet, but it doesn't look good. Street, Street Masters was the indeed the inaugural design by Blacklist Games, the inaugural instance of the multi-deck system that Adam Sadler and Brady Sadler mostly kind of ripped off from Sentinels of the Multiverse. And but they, but they put a cool name on it. Doesn't they, that make it theirs? No. <laughs> No, you have to plant a flag. Oh, you have to put a ring on it, not name it. Okay, flag, sorry. ring, gotcha. you know, some All kind right. of marker. Yeah, that's the problem. All right. Well, the logo might count, but that's the kind of thing that courts would decide. Oh, okay. And Street Masters is a sort of side-scrolling, beat-em-up genre of game where you have to punch the ever-loving crap out of a boss. And very much like a lot of modular setups, and not entirely unlike Sentinel of the Multiverse, sometimes you end up with setups that are not ideal. Doesn't happen all the time, but I really feel like this, this this setup we had was pretty close to perfect. It was a great setup. The stage was interesting. We were in a classroom full of brainwashed students, and we were doing flip kicks off the desks. Sometimes you had to jump up on the desk because there were a whole bunch of weird ninja-like things that were swooping along the floor. And there was this podium that was mind-controlling things. You could pump the podium. And there was this weird martial arts cabal that was recruiting these students. And the leader was this incredibly powerful master, but who was who was incredibly deadly, but a little fragile. And we were all incredibly close to death when we won. And it was great. I All the characters were able to operate on full cylinders. We got to do the cool things associated with our characters. And I really think it was one of the best instantiations of the modular deck system. Everybody got to do their fun thing, and all the elements were working together. Yeah, I've never had a bad game of Street Masters. I've had less good games of Street Masters. This one was very interesting that you guys were nice enough to run ahead to test the strength of the boss. <laughs> and, and, and found out he was indeed very strong. Yes, I believe in the second round, when we closed with the boss to engage with the boss, he took out about half our health in one round, and so we're like, maybe we should revisit this later when we're ready. But it was it was great. All of the characters have great theme to them. You can sort of put in your own sort of swing on how characters work. Tons of different characters you can play. I had one that was like yet another two-phase type character. I love playing that type of thing. Yeah, you were the janitor who turns into a, a massive mutated monster a la the Toxic Avenger, but not quite. Yep. Reminiscent of, but not def not really in the same register. And it has the, that very interesting token system where you're collecting these defense tokens. And there's all sorts of different ways you can get these defense tokens. And you can sort of see what the boss is going to do or what the enemies are going to do to you and, and try to collect those particular ones if you have that opportunity. And the second thing it really does well is the enemy's turns. Because when it's your turn, you're going to spawn an enemy maybe more than likely and then you are in sort of in control of that enemy so every time it comes around to you it spawns there's not this giant you know all of the enemies move and do their thing and bog the game down it's just short little stints of of guys moving one at a time the boss does have their own turn but it's really not that big a deal I agree. There are lots of systemic elements to the modular deck system of later games, particularly Ultra Quest and Hour of Need, that I wish existed that could be backported into Street Matches, in particular, a slightly more flexible action structure. But you'd have to redesign the decks around that. And so at the end of the day, Street Masters is probably still my favorite of the systems, both by virtue of the fact that the bits fit together really, really well, and the huge variety of things that are available, just by virtue of the fact that it was the first. There have been two successful Kickstarters. There have been 
been a bunch of expansions that have released, and systems like this really thrive when there's a lot of different variety, so long as you avoid the occasionally degenerate setups. And I, I, I appreciate the fact that you've never had a... De- I, I don't think I've ever had a truly degenerate setup. That's what I mean, yeah. But I've had setups that were definitely less good than others, like one character has an ability that nerfs a boss, and so it's still perfectly satisfying, but you don't really feel like you're being challenged. I definitely feel like the degenerate setups, the true degeneracies, are the kind of uh, setups that you sometimes get in Sentinels of the Multiverse, where a particular character depends on, say, equipment or ongoing cards of another type, and the boss routinely strips every one of those cards. Those ones are just flatly less fun yeah, and that, can leave people feeling frustrated. Or if the boss you know, com- completely integrates with the environment right and they sort of play off each other and gang up on you then it gets really bad absolutely so in that sense i think you know as much as i give the the sadler brothers crap for ripping off the modular deck system it does seem slightly more robust in its complexity when compared to sentinels so at the end of the day uh street masters is a wonderful game i've got a huge brick of all the available content i might be getting more but then again who knows (laughs) it's tough to tell it's an ongoing disaster with respect to blacklist games i've talked about that enough but it is always good to be reminded why I decided to give them all these interest-free loans in the first place, since so that was Street Masters. On the vein of successful co-op games, we got to play Old Tree. Old, o- OL Tree? O- there's two Asante. You're an insult to bilingualism. There's two As- Asante E's here, Martin. Asante? Asante Goose? Goose. Asante Goose. Yeah. Old Tree. The name of the game is Old Tree. Oh, there we go. It's designed by Anton Boza and John Grumpf. And put out by Studio H. Studio Ash. Studio Ash. In this context, it's an Ash. Ah. Yeah. My apologies. The listeners, they come for the French walker. Well, not for me. They don't. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so No, they come for you and sometimes also for the French. There you go. So this is a cooperative game where you're going around the map and you're, you know. Putting out fires putting and out fire resources. Yeah, much like many others. I'm just not sure what the, who this game is for. It's such a basic system that. It is great for a sort of uh, intro game or a family game, but then it has this, I don't want to say fiddly, but just for its weight, the sort of, you know, roll a die and move the turn sequence. And really, maybe, you know, this, this card will go over here and this card will go here. Maybe it's an event. Maybe it'll move twice. It just seemed fiddly to me for whatever huh. reason, for the weight of the game. And then the, the, how much writing there was on the card. That's not a big deal. But I mean, just like, like I said, once again, for the weight of the game and for like sort of an intro thing, you'd usually want to have it a lot, you know, more streamlined and quicker. And the card just does what it does. And that's it. Not this, all of this story and theme on the cards madness. I think this is an excellent family game for people who have uh, children or all the people participating in the game who have a level of literacy such they can read a paragraph of reasonably well-written English. And I don't mean that dismissively. I really think that this this would be a good family weight game. It is not as interesting as Pandemic. It is not as interesting as a lot of other cooperative games of that ilk, but it nonetheless has a very Pandemic structure in that there are fires to go put out. But they appear randomly, unlike the sort of interesting geometry that you get from the threats of Pandemic in recurring areas. And the other thing that is salient about Autre is it is probably one of the best looking games I've played in a long time. That it's, is for sure. It's got this wonderful Vincent Dutre art. The meeples representing the characters are all screen printed with lovely, sort of vaguely medieval kind of representations of the character. Yeah, stained glassy looking. It, precisely. That's exactly the word. All the resources are deluxe. All the elements in the box are these very well illustrated boxes with fl- with flap lids on them. It's the kind of thing that you would expect to see from the deluxe hundred and ten dollar USD deluxe version from a Kickstarter. I'm not exaggerating. Like that. That's what I would expect to see. But this was the retail release. <laughs> And another really cool thing they did is that there was sort of like a storyline deck or would you say an event deck? Well, there was there were two, really. There was the storyline oh, deck and then there was true. kind of sort of an event there deck. There was the event. Okay, so this was the storyline deck. So you would flip a card and it would have part of the story. And then on the back of the next card would be an illustration of what you're reading on that card. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, not Sorry, it's very clever. Yes. And I, again, visually, everything I think is exceptionally well done. Uh, this is above me on the fact that I really love Vincent Dutre as an artist. It's it's even got these 
varying levels of abstraction in terms of representation, a whole bunch of different art styles. As you said, there's the sort of stained glass elements on the back of issue cards. There's a somewhat abstract line drawing just in, in monochrome of what the issue might represent, these various fires that you're trying to put out. But then in the Chronicle is what it's called. There's a variety of different scenarios called Chronicles. They have just standard fantasy full color art, but the representation of the different characters and the standard monster types are done with a great deal of personality and character. Visually, I thought it was completely a home run. Maybe somewhat disappointed that I didn't find the gameplay very engaging. It was relatively quick. We played the first scenario. It was about an hour as advertised. And there were kind of choices-ish. Uh, and the activation system was kind of okay-ish. But ultimately, it didn't grab me. And yeah, I... it was move, do an action. Yeah, and the action was uh, generate successes. So you need so many successes. And then depending on what buildings we unlocked and what skills our character had, we'd get so many dice and you need so many successes. Right. And then you do this over and over and over and over. Yeah. And over again. Yeah, pretty much. So other than the visual appeal and the thought that it might appeal to some more family level gaming, uh, I didn't really see the appeal of Autre, but oh man, I still, I still really like the visual representation and it has made me consider what we expect out of a deluxe production and what we're willing to pay for a deluxe production and what you can still get done in a retail context. Because I'm beginning to think increasingly, in addition to the fact that, that Kickstarter is is getting prohibitively expensive, I think we've been giving publishers a free pass. Because if you can put out what, what Studio Ash did in the basic repo, retail production, I don't know why we're paying the triple digits for some of these deluxe versions. QV, Stroganoff, and a number of other recent... Because it's an interest-free loan yeah, for several I know, years. I know. I know I'm a sucker. And I know having said this, I'm going to go throw money at some stupid project in five hot seconds. I'm just saying that there are still some companies that can put out base-level, priced appropriately productions, and they look like deluxe productions. So that was Autre by Antoine Boza, one of our favorite designers, and John Grumpf. Played half a game of Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape. Locals have been clamoring for the stupid, enjoyable, dice-pitching nature of Massive Darkness 2. I finally repatriated it from Boston, and we set up a scenario. Unfortunately, there was a, a, a bit of a health issue that required us to stop halfway through. But nonetheless, everyone was having fun with their different character classes. As I've said before, in Massive Darkness 2, one of the innovations is every character class does has their own little minigame. I decided to play as a ranger. Normally, I don't like rangers. It's not an archetype that I find appealing. But uh, this ranger happened to be a heavily armored centaur, and so at that point, why not? And I, I joked previously that the minigame that rangers play in Massive Darkness 2 is that they play Mystic Veil. Vale. I was actually underselling the nature of the minigame. It's actually more in-depth than Mystic Veil, vale, because in Mystic Veil, vale, if people remember the John D. Clare card crafting game, you pull cards until you draw a certain number of moons, and then you play all the cards you've got. There's no real penalty for busting, except for rare, rare circumstances. When I first heard the, the setup for Mystic Veil, uh, vale, I thought it was going to be one of those press your luck instances where you would be penalized for busting, not so much. As a ranger, Every time you make an attack, you start pulling cards from your own unique deck. If you generate seven arrows worth across the top of the deck, you've hit a bullseye and you get to activate all the bullseye effects of all your cards and all your skills. If you stop early, you get to generate the hit effects on all your cards, which are good, but not as good as the bullseye effects. If you generate more than seven arrows, you bust and you have to apply all the debuffs on all the cards that you've pulled up till this point. It's really cool. Now, it only triggers when you attack. But Massive Darkness 2 is not what you would call labored with a whole bunch of non-attack actions to begin with. And when you're heavily armored centaur that fires a triple bow, mostly you find yourself shooting at enemies. So, in that sense, it's hardly much of a trade-off. And, again, rogues do bag building. There's a rondelle associated with the wizard. Uh, the necromancer is playing this weird resource management game to summon monsters that we've already killed. It's great fun. The components, I... Uh, the, the quality of miniatures casting has really improved by leaps and bounds. And despite my previous comments about deluxe editions sometimes not looking deluxe, when you get a Culminary or Not project that is full of miniatures, you may be you may want to roll your eyes at the fact that grown humans want to play with little dollies and pay lots and lots of money for them, but you cannot deny these are well-made dollies. Do you feel that the, all the mini games take up the same amount of time? Do you think there's one character that's like, ugh, he's attacking again. He's like <laughs> drawing like 30 cards. Let's go take a food break while he goes through his deck again. <laughs> or do you think they are, they, did they balance it well that they all take roughly the same amount of time? I would not want someone who was prone to pointless analysis. Okay. So there's different kinds of people who are prone to different kinds of analysis paralysis, right? 
There's the Euro Optimizer Analysis Paralysis. I don't really think that they would have any more or less inclination towards making the game drag for any given class. But then there are the people who have an attitude towards risk, where they really don't know whether they feel like taking a risk or not. I wouldn't give them the Ranger ever. I could see them sitting on like five arrows and being like, how many arrows have I pulled in? Let me go look through my discard again. Every single time they do an attack. I am not that player. So I look at it and I figure five arrows, eh, and I just make a decision yes or no. Other than that, I don't think there's a whole lot of analysis paralysis possible. Maybe if you're playing a rogue, you might want to try out your idea, uh, plan out your ideal turn or whatever. But again, it's hard to take Massive Darkness 2 too seriously. But no, let's say if it's the same player playing all of the classes, is there a particular class that just by default, because of what they have to do, would be longer than the others? Uh... Again, it depends on what kind of things. Tend- I haven't seen all the classes in play. Gotcha. There are lots. Of- I haven't seen the bard work. I haven't seen the shaman work. There's a whole lot of different classes to play. Uh, probably if somebody was prone to the traditional style of optimization analysis paralysis, maybe the paladin. Because they are in an interesting support class element where they put out a blessing on a given zone. And they might start to think, okay, well, if you activate first and you take advantage of this zone and then I activate and then I move the zone over there and then I take advantage of that, they that could start to drag. Gotcha. But again, Games like Massive Darkness 2 are meant to be played fast, and we have been playing at a reasonable rate, and so I, I, I don't see that as a prevalent issue. And honestly, the kind of player who would play that way, I don't think they would consent to play Massive Darkness 2 to begin with, and that's fine. They should stay away from such things. Massive Darkness 2 remains incredibly fun for me, for what it is. It's designed by Alex Altianu and Marco Portugal, put out by Kumli or not this year. We return to Paint the Roses, designed by Ben Goldman and put out by... I keep forgetting who puts this game out. If only they put it on the back of every tile. Oh, yeah. This is by North Star Games, and what you're doing is you're you're putting out all the rose bushes for the Queen of Hearts, and you're using these bushes to sort of figure out what cards everyone is holding at that particular time. They all have different patterns on them, and what I've, what I've seen in almost every game is how well they balanced it. It always seems to come down right right to the end, the last couple tiles, and the queen is just about to chop off your head, and it always leads to a very tense last turn of the game. What is your win rate, just out of curiosity? I think I've won twice out of the five times I've played it. Okay. I only ask because I don't have concerns. I was, this is pure curiosity. I've never won, so I'm sure there's a small number of people on the Discord, the Guild, and Twitter who are now going to be telling me every time they win the game. Maybe when you fight against like royalty and queens and kings and such things, <laughs> it's, it doesn't work well. quite possibly. No, no, I'm just curious. I thoroughly enjoy it. I don't have any concerns about the balance. I'm curious about the other scenarios. I think that to a certain extent, the win rate could probably go up if we were obsessive note takers. But the note taking system that they've de- devised, although I think it's about as good as they can get, seems tedious and complicated. And honestly, when we play with Huey, Huey just takes notes in the background and does his thing. When we feel compelled to start engaging in note-taking because we need to suss out whatever there's a hard card and we're close to the end of the game, it ends up being clumsy and awkward. So, <laughs> But then again, just as I said, in, in, the, in the context of Massive Darkness 2, it's as true in Massive Darkness 2 as it is in Paint the Roses. I tend to play heuristically. I tend to play by sort of abstracted feeling about where things are, which is not to say I make random obscure guesses in Paint the Roses, but yeah, it remains delightful. Paint the Roses is a marvelous little co-op deduction game. I think it's extremely clever. And as you say, the arc of the game does manage to ratchet up tension in a very exciting way. The components are amazing. Even the sort of how you put it away and take it out works very well. Well, we have the deluxe version. We do. That is Paint the Roses. Let me tell you a sad story, Walker. Uh-oh. A story that's even sadder than the Queen of Hearts arbitrarily decapitating her gardeners for no good reason. And that is a tale of a young boy. Let's call this young boy Mark. Wait, no, that's a little too on the nose. Marcus. Let's call him Marcus. There you go. No one will ever guess. Who brings games that he wants to play to game night. And for the past three or four weeks, no exaggeration, I, I mean Marcus, has brought Groundhog Day the game. And every week he has not been able to play it because when he's ready to play it, someone else has, without his permission, taken it from his bag and already set up and started playing the game. I'm not going to dwell on the without permission part because whatever, it's a public game day, that's fine. It's more the I don't get to play the game. But finally, I got to play more of Groundhog Day the game. 
Groundhog Day, the game, is Prospero Hall's riff on The Mind. They really should have attributed it because it's very, very similar to The Mind. I haven't played The Mind, but conceptually it's it's a dead ringer in a lot of ways. However, it introduces this additional constraint that each day, each round, has to be better than the last one. And so there's this trade-off between, well, we need to play cards in a, a certain order, but we don't want the cards to be too good. Does this card I have, is it good enough? Is it too good? Is it too bad on later days, etc., etc.? All towards getting towards the perfect day. And it's a pretty hard game. I've only won a small handful of times. Usually what happens is someone gets a little overexcited. They see in their hand that they've got two perfect day cards and they start to figure, well, it's a four player game. I've got two perfect day cards. So if everyone else has two perfect day cards, that's the seven perfect day cards we need for a given round. So clearly we're going to win. And they play the two cards and then everyone's like, well, we're done <laughs> because they know that it's not happening. But that's fine. It's a collective risk game of risk taking, and sometimes co-op games can be tanked for one by one player's misplay, which is okay, especially when the game is sufficiently short and has a cute little groundhog meeple. It's true, and you know you have that nostalgia of the movie and and the little scenes that are played out on the cards, and you get to punch Ned Ryerson. He's an awful newscaster. No, he's not a newscaster. He's it, the insurance salesman. Is it, is it? I thought it was his rival newscaster. No, no, he, he doesn't have a rival newscaster. He's uh, without peer in the newscasting. It's been so long since I've seen it. Dated your sister in high school until you told me to stop. Bing again. <laughs> that is Groundhog Day of the Game. We played Uwe Rosenberg's newest game, Framework. This is put out by Edison Spielwise. And it is a nice, basic tile lane game where you're making your own little grid of frames and scoring opportunities. It's got an interesting sort of drafting system where whoever's the active player gets to draft two tiles. Gets to. Gets to. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I was going to, yeah. I was going to compare it to San Francisco, which we just taught, which we just played where you're drafting piles of cards, but they just arbitrarily let you discard whatever cards you want at no penalty. Whereas this one, you have to fit these tiles into your thing, which I think would make San Francisco a much better. Anyway, won't dwell on that. Moving on to, f to framework, you are putting these frames and they have to be connected if you want them to score. And some tiles have frames and scoring opportunities. So you're just trying to do this balance of keeping colors that you can control and and you, and it's the, I think the player interaction is A, hate drafting and B, trying to get frames that other people aren't also taking, right? So at least you have some opportunities to get some connections going. Yeah, sometimes you do indeed look over at your opponent's tableau and there's a little bit of additional interaction by virtue of the fact that, oh, this is a high copper scoring condition. And I know that I'm downstream of somebody who really loves copper, so I probably shouldn't go for this or, or this, that, or the other. Uh, I was actually very surprised by how much I enjoyed Framework. It is purely a spatial puzzle in terms of path optimization and somebody at the at the game was over after the game was over remarked that it reminded them of calico and i think that's pretty apt calico as well is about arranging abstract shapes in a way to maximize your scoring possibilities but whereas calico literally gives me a headache no exaggeration i found framework to be surprisingly accessible and approachable for someone with my ad admittedly limited st skill set so completely themeless almost brazenly so just a touch of player interaction, a touch of angst about what to do with tiles, because as you observe, you want to keep contiguous, uninterrupted networks of similar colors and or scoring conditions, and so sometimes you end up with tiles that don't meet your original plan, you have to shove them somewhere and make plans around them. Yeah, Framework was, I, I think, a perfectly reasonable 45 to 60 minute tile drafting thing. Yeah, I'll just to go over the rules just very briefly. There are some scoring opportunities on the on the tiles. When you succeed in them, you put out these tokens, of which you have 22. And whoever puts them all out first wins, which is usually the way it goes. But if for whatever reason, the way the tiles go, if you run out of tiles, the game ends as well. I was also surprised by how quick it was. When I heard that you had to meet 22 scoring conditions, I thought the game was going to take forever. But no, framework moves along the brisk clip. Played a game of Circadian's Chaos Order. We talked about this for the first time a couple of weeks ago. This is a review copy we got from the publisher, designed by S.J. McDonald and Zach Smith. This is a highly asymmetric troops on a map game put up by Garpel Games. And this is one of those times where second plays can be very, very helpful. Because the first play we played was with three players, and I felt that all the way that all the different factions worked was interesting. One faction wanted to win fights. Another faction wanted to do damage in fights and was often, not always, 
indifferent to who won. And so fights between those two factions would sometimes be interesting. The faction who wanted to win wanted to win, but at the same time, while taking as few casualties as possible, because they knew that the other faction would be out for blood. And then there was another faction who wanted to research. And so they got sometimes they had special powers that gave them research when winning fights of a particular type. There was an interesting set of interactions between those two. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. On to play two. In play two, we tried the other factions as uh, well as one of the factions that we played before, and I thought the interactions were incredibly uninteresting. And in point of fact, they were so bad that I started getting angry, like very frustrated at how the interest of the first game had been completely blown by the setup of the second game, because there's this one faction that, depending on how you play them, can more or less win one fight around without any serious threat to them. It just doesn't seem like you can dislodge them from their one priority in a given round. Because that one mechanism changed how the whole game sort of flowed. Absolutely. Because it sort of brought us back to the way we used to play most war games, where there's these huge buildups, and every turn would be centralized in one fight because everyone would, you know, pile all their troops right. into one area. And this no is, skirmishes, just drawn out battles. And, yeah. and this is what happened in this game because of the one faction that was almost unbeatable. You had to move your troops around in giant clumps to have any sort of chance. And I think that totally blew the game. Well, and even more to the point, it forced people to engage in interactions that didn't really exploit their shared interests. So, for example... I originally had various intentions about where to spread out along the map, but then after the first couple of battles where it became clear that this one faction, if they fought only a couple battles a turn, were more or less unbeatable, well, that just forced me to move elsewhere. And so that just dislodged... The entire map became weird and perverted because there was this unbeatable wall of death that you couldn't mess with unless the turn order was in your favor. That's a separate thing. Like, there's still some some really clever bits in Circadian's Chaos Order. The things it does with player order is kind of neat. The way it does the action selection is still kind of cool. A lot of the other elements of faction asymmetry are bad, uh, are, are interesting. But I also just started thinking about all the other factions and the way they would interact with this one. They're called the, they are the namesake Circadians. They move around in a dropship. Their troops are super powerful. Their dropship gives them additional special powers. And they were just drowning in shields as well as combat strength. And so I started thinking, okay, well, the faction that wants to win fights can never win fights against them. The faction that wants to inflict kills can't inflict kills on them because they're drowning in shields. And then at the end of the day, the fact, but they weren't even the faction that won. Now, had the game gone the distance to round six, still a pretty long game. We played for about two and a, two and a half hours. And when the game goes the full distance, which we've never gone, it's all going to concentrate on one area. And whoever wins that one area is going to win the entirety of the game. I was very glad in both games we never got there because I could easily imagine that feeling very degenerate and interesting. Just plowing all our troops. You have a weird series of battles with huge numbers and, Ugh, not something I'd look forward to. But getting back to what I was ready to talk about, the faction that wins by research, initially that seems interesting, but they've won both the games we've played, and I think I know why. It's because there's not much you can do to them. I mean, sure, you can go kill them. What do they care? They <laughs> take their territory. Fine. Doesn't matter to them. <laughs> research is an action that in almost all ways is not something you can prevent or preempt. And so they're not even a very interesting game clock because there's already a game clock built into it. So it's not even that they're overpowered. It's just that they're not interesting. And so the promise that the first game had, I think, completely fell apart in the second. And it left me incredibly disappointed and rather frustrated. It's true, because the first one was so promising. It was really cool. Now, there are some possible suggestions. Like, the player who played the Circadians made an excellent suggestion. Maybe you should only include the Circadians if you're playing with all six players. Then, at least, all the factions that can't really do the interesting interactions with the Circadians, they will have more targets and more other people with which to interact... That, I think, would blunt some of the concerns. But at the end of the day, I still feel like a lot of the the, the creaks in the gears were starting to show. And again, the, the promise of the first play left me very optimistic. But in the second play, it just dashed. Speaking of things that dashed, two games of Four Science Ago was fairly dashed at, at the, at the <laughs> gaming night. There was chaos and and not the good kind either and and noise yes not the good kind of chaos so we decided that table we, kicking we there was there was there inadvertent was... table kicking i saw i saw murder in walker's eyes when walker puts his hand on the table looks down and sighs deeply and starts breathing a certain way you know you know he's got thoughts of violence that he's desperately trying to suppress he's looking for his blood bucket exactly all right yes yeah, so we said we had to get four signs to the table and of course once again it doesn't fail to delight in this game, it is a, a dexterity game mixed with some 
tile laying puzzle mixed with some silly special powers and and card play. Everything about it is a great game. I love For Science. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. I argue that it is kind of uh, a super filler. You disagree. You think that there's too many rules for it to be a filler. That's fine. We can we can teach the controversy. The only strike I have against For Science is that the box is too big to throw it into your into your bag as an impulse bring along. But other than that, I've got nothing against For Science. I still find myself, after, I think i played a couple dozen times now, I still find myself in situations where I look at a build that is set out by the cards telling you how to build things, and I look at someone's successful build, and I'm like, how did you get from there to there? And it really does make you look at these spatial connections in an entirely different way. And as for somebody who's been playing stacking games for about 20 years, that's really impressive. For Science, designed by R. Eric Rouse and published by Gray Fox Games. Finally, we got to play Vengeance. Vengeance is by Gordon Kalea and put out by Mighty Boards. We were thinking of playing the prototype that was sent to us of Gordon Kalea's new game, which involves some of the same dice manipulation elements as Vengeance. And indeed, we had the box, and inside the box were components. There were discs. Very nice discs. Very nice discs. Some dice. Dice. Tokens. Lots of cards. No rule book, though. <laughs> <laughs> So without the rule book, we were not really in a position to try the new... <laughs> but completely independently, I point out, Huey suggested that we play Vengeance. Huey's a big fan of Vengeance, and so the three of us sat down and we took out some bloody, bloody Vengeance on some gangs that meant to do us wrong. Now, was, uh, given that we've been playing a lot of Vengeance roll and fight recently, I couldn't help but feel a greater emphasis on all the non-killing elements, because there's actually a surprising amount of management you need to do between rounds during the so-called montage phase. You need to make sure that your wound situation is under control. You need to make sure that you've scouted locations so that you're not going in blind. And you also need to train up so that you're not completely at the mercy of the dice. The one element that I think that can lead to some genuine frustration in Vengeance, and I don't really see an easy fix for it, is sometimes you're just in a position where you have to go into dens blind and hope they miraculously have some possibility of scoring. Because they might not. It is entirely possible that just they just won't. You have five opportunities to go engage in bloody combat over a game of vengeance. And one or more of them might be completely spoiled by the fact that you didn't scout well enough and or you got unlucky when scouting and or you got unlucky when going in. Well, on top of that, you sort of have to hope that it spoils somebody else as well. Right. Right, that even though you went in blind, it doesn't have any cards that you need, you're hoping that it... it is cards that somebody else needed. And sure. therefore, now you, you're both sort of equaling out. And it was a close game of vengeance, and I can't help but feel that the victor was determined entirely by the fact that the victor on the last combat just stumbled into a den that they needed blindly. There was a blind one and two uh, shot, and it just so happened to work out in favor of the victor who ended up going and managed to kill the right people at the right time. Because really, that's what vengeance teach, teaches you about. It's a lot like life. You have to kill exactly. the right people in the right time in the right way. Just so. It's very Aristotelian in that way. It's practically a treatise on the Nicomachean ethics. And, well, and it does it the right way, where you look into their eyes and you slowly watch them dim as their life and dreams fade away. That's beautiful, Walker. Are you, are you a poet? I am. Yeah. 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 So I was even thinking after, I cannot think, you know, because me... What I, you know, well, if only this game did this, or if only, you know, I can't think of any way that you could change Vengeance to make it any better. I think there are, it's not a perfect game. Yeah. But I think within its confines, I think it does what it does very well. Yeah. I think it's longer than it needs to be. But like, but like I always say, there are plenty of short games. It's not terrible to have one that goes a little longer once oh, sure. in a while. And I think this one is perfectly fine. You know, the the fighting is kind of exciting, you know, and it doesn't really take that long. It's three rolls, and as long as you're not – and I think if if people do start taking a long time, then you can introduce the timer like you're supposed to. Yes. But we were going through it at a fairly good clip. Still took a while, but still was super fun. Yeah, and – a lot can be forgiven because of the near perfect thematic integration and evocation of a revenge movie. I want Vengeance to be a co-op game. I want there to be an expansion that turns it into a co-op game that manages to A, import some of the additional story-driven elements of the solo version, because there are character story-driven elements in the solo version that you don't see in the competitive version. And B, that really harnesses the energy that we invariably get around the table anyway. It just I don't know if this is just our playstyle. We're not especially 
averse to competitive games. We trash talk all the time and we're pretty confrontational a lot of different games. But whenever we play Vengeance and someone's in a den, even if they go into a den that we desperately wanted to go to, we're like, well, you could use this ability on this die and turn into this thing and then you get more murder. And like, oh yeah, that is how I get more murder. And so if you could channel that into a, into a slightly more traditional co-op version, then uh, that would make me eminently happy. But as I said, and as you observed, it gets right a lot more than it gets wrong. And so I'm more than happy to overlook the flaws. It is not a perfect game, but sometimes some of the most creative games are better by virtue of the fact they are so obviously flawed. And Vengeance is absolutely one of those delightful little hidden gems in the hobby that I don't think enough people have been exposed to. I am glad that at least Vengeance Roll and Fight has been getting more media exposure of late. Yeah, and I because it's been so long since I since I played Vengeance, I really like sort of the tie-in with the roll and write. There are a lot of elements that they sort of capture. Like you said, you don't get that whole montage and that how they've wronged you so bad and why you're going in there because it it so much hits at home oh, yeah. in the board game and where it is completely gone in the roll and fight. But other than that, I like how a lot of the symbology is the same, a lot of how the all the abilities are the same and how the maps look very identical. Both very excellent games. Yeah, I'm very pleased to have both in my collection. I'm very pleased to be able to keep playing both. I think they both have different sets of strength. I think that Vengeance Roll and Fight is indeed closer to, to being that sort of doesn't really have the same flaws, doesn't really have the same rough edges or the same sharp edges. But those between round bits, those management elements, not only are they sort of interesting to giving sort of more context to the interesting dice based context, but as you said, just the additional narrative that comes through and the motivation and the satisfaction of them killing these people. Uh, really in- improved. And they do such a great thing because it's a it's sort of a, a roll and fight, whereas all these other roll and rights have like no player interaction. Yeah. This one has extreme player interaction where you're trying to roll so fast to get, get so you get the most use of out of all the dice and rob the other players of the dice. Well, and more to the point, what would you rather do? Would you rather take the yellow seven that then lets you cross off the, the yellow seven in your grid or would you rather take the sword result which allows you to stab a bad guy in the room you're standing in? One of these two, I think, is more interesting. <laughs> exactly. But besides, besides even interest, there's more tactical possibilities because at the end of a at the end of a dice rolling session of roll and fight, you have all these actions that you can trigger in any order. You're not just throwing out a spreadsheet. You're determining what to do in a vaguely skirmish esque environment. Anyway. We've talked a lot about Vengeance and Vengeance Roll and Fight. Still continuously engaging games. Can't wait to try Gordon Kalea's next work the moment he sends me the rules. Gordon, if you're listening to this, send me the rules, Gordon. And those are the games we did not play and some of the games we did play. Send me the rules. This week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. The news is it's Monday evening and I still don't have the rules. <laughs> it's, these are true facts. Mark, the next T game has been announced. This is the T-Series from Simone Luciani and De- De- Danielle Tazzini. The board and dice people, they like to put out games that start with T. This one's called Tiletum. Or Tiletum? I'm or not tiletum, sure. Or or Tileum. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> there are sounds. And there's dice, like much of their other other games. Yes, it is a dice-driven action selection game. Going around Shocker. a, a rondelle. It looks very interesting. All of their other games have been very well received, and I enjoyed all of them, so I'm looking well, very much looking forward to this one. I've yet to try Terracotta Army, which should be out very soon. Yeah, so Daniela Tashini has been involved in some sensitivity training, as provided by Board and Dice. Board and Dice, really, I think their approach to the whole Daniela Tashini controversy, where he had an interview published in which he boasted about using the N word and how ta- he talked about how it was the job of women and other underrepresented groups to bust into an exclusive environment. It wasn't the responsibility of anyone else to make space for them. A whole bunch of regrettable remarks. Initially, he doubled down, but then he apologized in an apology, but then his apologies gradually started getting better, which is to say progress. And Board and Dice, uh, I, I really find as a company, their response to be very, very interesting. Initially, their response was, he has done bad. He should, that is bad. And then as the, the apologies started getting better, they're like, well, we're going to reach out to him in conjunction with some of our other publishers and see what's to be done. And they they eventually came to the solution that, well, he seems to be genuinely repentant. We're going to have some sensitivity training and see what, we'll see what's what. And then they decided to continue their working relationship with him. It's been, it's, it's been overall, I think, an interesting developing story. And for what's l- l- little it's worth, it seems to have ended pretty happily. Like I've been trying to pay attention to a lot of the stakeholders involved who were harmed by Tashini's initial remarks. 
remarks. And by that, I mean the vulnerable people that he was either disparaging or talking about how it was their problem to bust into a limited market or those who had been harmed by his use of racial slurs. And overall, the response is not universal, but it seems to be edging towards positive. So it looks like Tashini on the whole is going to be let in from the cold. But it's an evolving story. We'll see. That's to let him or something. We don't know how it's said. Brief HeroScape update, <laughs> because I'm going to release HeroScape news as I get it, because I am super obsessed. Old style terrain? Yes. Backwards compatible? Yes. Pre-painted miniatures? No. I don't know how I feel, Walker. Actually, I do know how I feel. I, I feel bad. I do. It's true. They claim, of course, because no company is ever just going to say, too expensive, we can't do it anymore. They instead say, well, you know, it's an invariable, con it's an inevitable consequence of the fact that miniatures are so much more detailed now, and there's no human way that we could... Nonsense. No, it's Hasbro just sees the bottom line. Yeah. And it's one of the whole reasons why HeroScape was stopped in the first place. Yeah. So, they want money. Well, <laughs> they can't produce the product in a marketable fashion when it, if it is to be pre-painted, they think. And that's entirely reasonable, and, you know, I'm not shocked. And it also looks increasingly like there are rumblings that it is going to be released through Hasbro Pulse, their weird, almost kind of sort of, but not really crowdfunding platform, except it kind of is crowdfunding. So not a traditional retail release, probably not going to be seen in a whole lot of big box stores, because that was part of the joy. I mean, honestly, I remember when, uh, I, I moved to the States shortly after the release of Heroescape, and I knew that my status as a sort of living in the U.S., not, not American, was only going to be cemented by my walking into a Target or a Toys R Us and purchasing a Heroscape Master Set at retail for something like $29.99 or $39.99 American or whatever ridiculous quantity of money was being sold back 10, 20 years ago. And uh, it was an almost religious retail experience, Walker. It's kind of sad that's not, that's not going to happen anymore. It's true. There was there was road trips. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. There was oh, yeah? road trips from Kingston to to places in the United States. Well, that's not too far. Watertown's what an hour and fifteen no, minutes well, we away. Went, we went as far as Syracuse. Oh wow. Okay. To to track down hidden gems of hero scale. Oh yeah, because the retail release sometimes was very spotty, and then there were the banner. That's, uh, those are the ones. Yeah, the the flag bearers. They were very hard to find. I went on elaborate public transit trips in and around Massachusetts to find the flag bearers. Ah, memories. Ah, uh, Heroscape. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really don't know what my attitude to Heroscape is, how much I would be willing to pay, slash whether I'd be willing to get the new stuff. It's tough to tell. I'd have to see what they're doing with the units, because the design team remains on point. Craig Van Ness and the other people at Heroscape, they know what they're doing, and interesting Heroscape units are very interesting, so... Looking forward to it, and we'll we'll bring you along. No doubt, every time, and dragging you along. Every time every I learn time. something, I will I will repeat it on the podcast. Finally, just another reminder: so very wrong about games. We'll be at the Shut Up and Sit Down Expo Shucks at September thirtieth to October second in Vancouver. Hope to see you there. We're going to be involved in a couple of panels. We hope more details to follow. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to our feature review, which is Space Station Phoenix. Space Station Phoenix was published this year by Rio Grande Games. It is designed by J Gabriel J. Cohn, whose previous design credits involve 2017's Exodus Fleet, which we have not played. This continues in Rio Grande Games' habit of publishing space-themed Euros. And also, I will note, it is continuing in Rio Grande Games' tradition of publishing first-time designers or near-first-time designers for major big-box Euro releases, which is not something you would have expected from Rio Grande based on its publishing history of, say, 10 to 20 years ago, but is definitely a pattern that they've established recently, and I, for one, am glad that they are giving new designers exposure to the market. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Space Station Phoenix? Need a job here at Phoenix Corp? We need your steel. I mean, steal a ship. I mean, get in your <laughs> ship and get over here. Rumor is it that there are space pirates in the area, so bolt on some extra armor and head out. Upon arrival, please evacuate all life forms from your vessel for decontamination. See you soon. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds so much more fun. <laughs> So, in <laughs> Space Station Phoenix, you're using your actions until you deem them ineffective, ditching them for steel in order to build your station, in order to house your victory points. Space Station Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, the entire conceit of the game 
is that you start off with all these ships that give you actions, and over the course of the game, you dismantle them to get the ever-so-precious steel you need to build out your space station. Because your ships give you actions, but they don't give you points. What gets you points mostly are additional station modules, and, as Walker pointed out, the various alien and human meat sacks that inhabit your station, but for that, you need to build out the station in the first instance. If you want to know about the theme, don't check inside your game or in your <laughs> rule book. You can go to the Real Grand website. They do have a page that does have some theme there for you to read. Yeah, it's weird. And, and again, like absence of theme in a Euro isn't, isn't unforgivable. But it is strange how it is only in the surrounding promotional stuff that you get any semblance of a theme. There's nothing in in the rule book. It's all of the surrounding marketing stuff that you actually get any hint of a theme. So let's talk about the setup of this game right from the beginning. Huge table hog. Yes. Lots of shuffling and you've got to sort out all of these tiles. There's three different colors of stations you can get and you need random ones for each player and spread them out on the on the board. Sometimes we even had a problem. If you watch the live playthrough, we had people having to walk around the table. We just ended up taking them and moving them to the other side of the table. A little bit of problem. Not that big a deal, but is an awfully big table hog. Well, it's one of those things, and we talked about a number of different games, I think, this week, where this problem manifests itself in different ways. And this is actually something I've, I've been thinking about. If you think about games, even radically different kinds of games, like For Science, For Science isn't necessarily as much of a table hog, but the problem is everyone needs to be able to access everything at one time. And so you quickly find yourself, oh, I can't put that there because then we'd run out of room. We can't put that there. That's out of someone's reach. So it gets very difficult to configure the table ideally. Similarly, in games like Space Station Phoenix, there are all these station tiles, which are very, very consequential for who builds what and when, but... They're pretty small, and they have very, very, very small text indicators about which one's which. And you kind of need to know about the available tile supply at all times. But if you're playing a three-player game, there are going to be 27 tiles at the start of the game. And so you can't put them such that they're within reach of everybody. And so it get, it gets to be somewhat problematic. Now, fortunately, it's the case that no one's going to forget they exist, right? Worst of all are cases of games. I talked about this most recently in the context of Millennium Blades, right? Where if there's a, a board that generates extra points, well, whoever's sitting next to that board is probably going to have an easier time of scoring those extra points. At least here in Space Station Phoenix, nobody's going to forget that there are Space Station tiles. They're just going to for constantly forget what they are. Yeah, I, I have that problem in, in Twilight Imperium. I always make sure I'm sitting right beside the victory point cards. Because <laughs> knowing them and seeing yes. them and knowing exactly what they are every time leads me to more victories than not. Well, all the, all, the, all the important information in Twilight Imperium is presented in big cards with big text, right? They wouldn't do something so stupid as to put a, put a whole bunch of stuff on small, car, small no, text cards. No, that'd, huh? be, that'd be crazy. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah, okay, good, good. So the other thing that happens in setup is... Like you said, one of the most interesting parts of the game where you get to choose your starting sort of central core of your station. Yeah, the core is, it, it's bizarre. So much of the game is about building up your station, but I find the station tiles to be more or less interchangeable. So a whole host of them differ only very slightly in terms of, well... This one gives you one extra dollar with your first person in it. This one gives you two extra dollars after you put in two people in it. This one gives you a water after your fifth. This one gives you a plant after your fourth. You know, weird, just negligible differences here and there. But your core that you start the game with, some of the cores are radically different and, quite frankly, very, very interesting. The last game I played, the core I started with supercharged all my actions, but every time I took income, we'll probably talk more about that later, I had to basically degrade the quality of my station. And it was cool. It gave a real shot in the arm, and it really changed the contours of the decisions I made about my economy. I can't really say the same about any space station tile I've ever purchased, built, or used. No, I really felt that yours was very interesting because not only did it change how you played, it also changed how I played. I would more often, because we talked about it before, that you would hardly ever take other players' actions. Mm, yeah, Mostly just centered on yourself or once in a while. This time I, I try to take a lot of your actions. I think uh, Sidewander did as well because every time you did income phase, which reset all the actions, you would have to take a penalty. So we were trying to limit you and, and make you take that penalty more than you actually would. Yeah, and similarly, I was using a lot of other people's ships, whereas in other, if I had other cores, I might just take an income turn. Yeah. I mean, my point is more that there's this interesting, I think, dichotomy between the very interesting station cores 
and the often borderline painfully generic space station segments, the sectors. Agreed. I'm Great s- cores, sectors not so much. I'm going to cycle back to that in a minute. But once the setup is done, then we get to the game. I'm just going to very briefly explain the game. You, you, It's like worker placement. You're going to choose an action either in front of you or in front of someone else. If you choose in front of someone else, it costs you more crystals. You pay the Gem, crystals. Gems walk. Gems, sorry, gems. Galactic exchange minerals. Why, thank you. Theme. Thank you so much, theme. And then there comes to a point where you want to start building your station and it costs a bunch of metal. And the main way to get metal is to take one of these actions that destroys one of your action placement spots. So throughout the game, you're going to get less and less uh, actions to choose. But there is also a sort of generic board that everyone can choose and they'll never get destroyed, but they're just very expensive. And usually by that time, you're getting more gems a turn anyway. So (laughs) those spots aren't so expensive. What that means is even though you have less actions and though, even though you said that the space station sections aren't that powerful, sometimes they do make the actions you have left more powerful. So not a huge amount of coolness, but it is interesting how even though you have less actions, the actions you have now are more powerful. Yeah, that's the central conceit of the arc of the game. And the designer has been very clear about that in the designer's notes as well as the publisher. You start off with the best action selection you're ever going to have. And people often question over the course of the game, even after I explain it very clearly, these are the ships you start with, you're never going to get any more. Usually around round four or five, people are like, so do we ever get any more ships? No, you never get more ships. And so as the game goes on, your options narrow, but your actions tend to get slightly better. So, for example, again, just mentioning some of the space station section sector tiles that I built in the past. When I tear down a ship, I might get three extra gems after tearing down a ship by virtue of a space sector tile that I built. And I built that sector tile after tearing off some other ships. And so my ability, my flexibility to tear away to tear down sectors gets smaller. My ability to build new sector tiles gets smaller. But I tend to have these minor bennies here and there every time something like that happens. And seeing these combos in the tiles, in the cards, in your core, core are, are the main reason I like this game. It's sort of like a, either like a Marco Polo or a Trucarion, where at the beginning of the game, you can look at the three different sections of the space station that you can build, and you can look through everything that's available and sort of try to parse out a combo. Like, this is going to work very well with my core. I want to have that pink one, that green one, and maybe this brown one. And it gives you sort of a goal to work towards. Maybe that level of of forward planning is why you do so much better at this game than I do. This is just one of those games where I'm very, very bad at it. And uh, I suspect that might be because I constantly get distracted by a whole bunch of extraneous stuff. At the end of the day, the scoring is relatively straightforward. Your primary source of points is going to come from sector tiles and the inhabitants of the sector tiles. You're going to get four, six, or ten points, depending on the size of the sector tile. And you're going to get two points for every inhabitant you get, plus there are bonus points for having majorities in the various types of inhabitants. Circling back to the inhabitants, I was also hopeful that that was going to prove to be interesting because I have very fond memories of lots of other sci-fi games, Galaxy Trucker in particular, that where the aliens have lots of personality and getting different kinds of aliens and staffing your spaceship was very important. Here in Space Station Phoenix, despite the fact that your staff is very important in terms of getting those bonuses and in terms of endgame points, it's they don't have any personality yeah, at all. Yeah, and they, just, go, they go through the trouble of making them all different colors and different shapes and the humans are in suits and the, and the meeples look interesting and you think that they're going to give you different modifiers when you get nothing. Yeah. You just tokens at the end of the day. And indeed, there's a lot of ways in which the game goes out of its way to make them more similar to each other. There are modules that say you get to put these kinds of aliens wherever you want, so the one differentiating factor completely goes away when you get those sector tiles. Humans get to go wherever they want. Anaerobic aliens get to go wherever they want. So at the end of the day, the differentiation is negligible. And I was also hoping, for what it's worth, that staffing the space station, you know... I've, I've wanted a game like FTL for a while, the computer game, and I knew that Space Station Phoenix wasn't going to be FTL, but staffing can be really interesting. Okay, I've got these staff. Where do they go? What tasks are they going to do at various times? In Space Station Phoenix, there's this notion about being able to move your staff from sector to sector. I've almost never felt the need to do this because, broadly speaking, you get a new sector tile, you get more staff to have them go in, and then that's it. They, yeah, they don't really move it, it seems detriment to spend those points on moving them when you can just buy new ones. Exactly. Because not only... Are you going to get the points for these new ones that you're not wasting those actions moving them around your station? Well, it's not an action. It's just something that's tagged on at the end of income, but it is money. And you want the points from new inhabitants anyway. So, yeah, you might as well. 
So like I was saying, the actions are very simple, which means the flow of this game is real because the actions are all relatively the same. Uh, everyone starts with the same basic cards and you're going to draft some like level two cards, they call them. And that part is semi-interesting because some of them are very powerful and you can sort of entice people to come and take them, which gets you more credits, stuff like that. And the flow is very good. It's also super easy to explain. For a game of this depth, it probably has one of the easiest rules explanations to depth of decision making I've seen in a while. True. And then there's the sort of trying to stretch out your round because as you use actions, you're leaving what you spent on them because you can't use them again until you've taken an income phase. So you're trying to, and that's sort of, I guess you could say a wasted turn, right? So More or less. So you're trying to stretch it out, use other people's actions, maybe forcing them to take an income, clearing their actions again, and then using their actions even more, thereby minimizing how many times you have to take an income. In, in many ways, and this is a very, very personal preference thing, it's the opposite of Beyond the Sun. I've talked many times about how, what I love about Beyond the Sun is you take income at the end of every turn. And so things don't ever feel cheap, but you don't feel like you have to waste a turn just to get where you want to go. Space Station Phoenix is exactly the opposite. You keep going until such time as you can't go no more. Sometimes you want to take income prematurely, but for many rounds, you just keep going until you can't, and then you take an income turn, and it's a wasted turn, as you said. You don't get to do anything interesting. There's no cool thing that, that tends to happen. Sometimes you get little side benefits and get to do little negligible actions here off to the side. That's a function of your station sectors, but it, it really does feel like you're you're not taking a step while everyone else continues to advance their interests. And when we say income, it doesn't mean you're going to get all of the resources. What you get in income is you get to clear your actions and you get a bunch of gems in order to take more actions. There might be some space station sectors that give you water or plants, but that is not usually the case. Which leads me to my next point is this random resource generation because it was a problem in our last game mm. where just people were not getting the plants they need because the way you get it is you take an action that lets you roll a bunch of dice or you're hoping to get a you know one in six chance of getting the resources that you need. Uh, well, no, it's actually, most of them, it's two and six. There are two die faces that show the, the, the plant and water resources. There are other ways to do it. You can use an exchange action to turn in any two cubes for the one cube you want. That is ended. That is how I ended up personally getting the resources that I routinely could not roll on the dice. But you're right that it is, it, it's again, part of the charm of the game. Part of the conceit of the game is that you don't really get a lot of income. You have to fend for yourself. It's a game about space, and the only thing you have really available are these ships. Yeah, money you can generate by yourself, sure, but most of the other resources you have to find, either by sending an expedition off to Earth, that's what the dice game is called, we just call it the dice game, or by tearing apart these ships that you have. It kind of sort of almost gives me the sense of privation in space. Not really, but almost. And then there's this whole diplomacy track. So it's a fairly large board. And what it does is you sort of go up this track and what it lets you do is get a slow trickle of, of gems, mostly, sometimes other resources, every time someone takes a particular type of action. So destruction action, I'm not going through all the actions. Every time someone takes an action, you're more than likely going to get something unless it's the actual diplomacy action itself. Yeah, that I found to be the more profitable and reliable route to steady income. And if in most circumstances, it can really forestall the necessity of taking the actual income action. If you've spread out across all the tracks, so nearly almost everything that people do gives you a reliable source of gems and or other, other resources, that can be fine. Now, and for those who know my hatred of tracks, these are not particularly tracky tracks. They all have the same costs associated with them. They're just a, a, a list of bonuses that you get when someone takes an action. And there are benefits in being in first place, so there is some mild element of player competition there because being at the highest level of the track is advantageous. So why are we doing all of this, Mark? We're doing this to get to an end game state, which is if someone hits the... That's very circular, but also yeah, profound. If someone gets to 40 points, the game will end. If someone completes all nine sections of their space station, the game will also end. I believe those are the two. Uh, there's also if you're with four or fewer aliens left on the board, but, okay. which has happened to me before. That's true, yes. There is a... Depending on the number of players, you're going to draw these aliens. You throw all the aliens into a bag, which I guess even is another reason setup is a little bit longer. Throw all hundred aliens. Not to mention racist. Into a bag, mix them around, and then start randomly, you know, drawing aliens. It's very violent. Yeah, they don't like it. So when one of these are met, everyone else gets one more turn, and then the game ends. And I have said before, you might have, you might remember this, I'm not sure, but, uh, 
tons of end game scoring is annoying to me, but not so much in this because you can you can pretty well look at over players' boards and you can see almost immediately how many points they're going to get. And in the last game we played, you and I, I think we ended the game with four or five points. Yeah, we had we had barely any points at all. And someone had gone almost much like the first game I played, where I had gone, you know all the way around the scoring track and then some and then passed everyone and still ended up, I think, in last place. So there is tons of endgame scoring and we've seen that it it very much depends on how well you've stocked your station by Absolutely. the end of the game. Especially after your first game, it's very easy to tell somebody, look, there's all this noise about scoring during the game and a variety of other things. Mostly you, what you want is exactly what we've said here in this review. You want space station sectors and you want them to be populated by by staff that's it and in, in point of fact you asked me a question about the rule book so i was looking at the rule book again and i was just looking at the the end game scoring example i just glanced at the hypothetical end game situation and said oh yeah yellow wins and sure enough <laughs> you know they go through like i'm not saying you can easily eyeball all the time but i just looked at it it looks like yellow is gonna win and sure enough <laughs> they had the most aliens in their space station they had the most tiles and the the most people in them yeah so tons of iconography and symbology, and I think it's all very well done. Oh, yeah. Because we've talked about uh, improving the actions and getting bonus and stuff, and that's all color-coded. So it's very interesting. So you can just take a quick glance across your board, and I'm doing a trade action. These are all the bonuses I'm going to get for this trade action. I'm going to be able to get an extra water, or I'm going to be able to roll an extra die, or whatever it is. It's very well laid out. Yeah, other than, as we mentioned earlier, the difficulty of everyone at the table for being able to clearly see the very small space station tiles, the information presentation is excellent, and it's very, very easy to explain the game and get started even for first-time players. And the variability in this game. So what we've talked about the hubs, your, your starting core of your space station, there's a giant pile of those, so all sorts of different things that can happen there. Uh, there's lots of different station sections, even though we said there's not much difference between them all. There is slightly, slight variations. And there's, we didn't talk about some of the level three, the very final parts of the space station you build do have some scoring opportunities to them. And then there are the ships that you draft at the beginning of each game. Very minor differences, but still something different that's going to mix up the game slightly. Yeah, so as an example of one of the level three sector tiles, one of them might be you get a bonus point for every pink alien you've got in your space station. Very like, minor, yes. It's like, okay, but they already give me two points flat anyway. Every alien already get, or human already gives me two points when they're in my station. So they tell me the pink aliens are worth three. Not a huge deal. And that, I think, goes to show the extent to which they really sort of fade into the background and lead to a sense of blindness. And that, that, that effectively is my overall critique. When I played Space Station Phoenix for the first time, I thought, this is a very, very novel inversion of the traditional Eurogame arc of a game, where you start out scrabbling for resources, not really able to do much, and the universe of possibilities gradually expands. Almost all worker placement games work this way, either because the, the field of actions is limited, as in the case of Agricola, or because the field of available options in terms of resources uh, for you to utilize is limited, as in the sense of A Feast for Odin, or in the sense of just the fact that you're incredibly weak, as is the case in both Agricola and A Feast for Odin. Here, you start out very, with, with more options than you're ever going to get ever again, even though they're all superficially kind of the same. And they gradually winnow down, winnow down, winnow down until you're left with this rump of an action selection mechanism and your station is developed. But the station ends up feeling so incredibly insignificant. The details of the station end up feeling so insignificant to gameplay. I really feel like the opening turns are the best turns. And so in a game that's solidly 90 to 120 minutes, because the game only ends insofar as players are able to force the end because they're making good decisions. So your early games are going to be longer than your later games. I really have felt that the last half of every game of Space Station Phoenix past the first has dragged because I know where it's going. There's so little player interaction. It's the same kind of cycle of generating metal and then buying stations and resource generation. But the options go down, the texture goes down, the options go down. I just, it really, really bugs me. And sometimes I think the box exists for a reason. It's an out-of-the-box idea. What if we invert the normal course of things? Well, turns out the box is good. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the box. Thank um, you. Let me back in. I, I'm, I'm mostly on the same page. I do believe it has limited plays, but I do enjoy those, I think, four or five plays that, that you know, you're experiencing new things and, and seeing how this thing plays out. I enjoy the chase. I enjoy 
figuring out that puzzle at the beginning, the trying to get aliens before other aliens disappear, the, like you said, you, you, I puzzle out this, this, the sections and I want to get them before other people can either a, they see what I'm doing or B, I can see that they might want them as well. And then there's the chase for the good action spots. Once people start destroying their ships, the, the, the choice of action spots slowly disappears. So you're like trying to grab them before other people can lots of stuff going on, but it is quickly getting stale. The description that I sometimes give to games or the classification I sometimes give to games is efficiency Euro. And there's been a discussion on the guild about what I mean by an efficiency Euro. Space Station Phoenix is, is a very good example of an efficiency Euro. You can just activate all your ships in whatever order, but that's going to be inefficient. And it's not the other players that are really putting a lot of pressure on you. They're only putting pressure on you in the sense that one of them might trigger the end game before you do, or sometimes the pool of alien supplies is going to run out, but then you just get these slightly more expensive aliens, which don't tend to run out nearly as fast. You can get to where you want to go. No one's going to stop you. You just need to do it faster than, than other people are doing it. And so all that's left is you hitting the buttons in the more efficient order in the slightly faster path. And again, I found that cool for the first game. You said you enjoyed the first four or five playings. For me, I think I enjoyed it the first one and a half plays, really. But after that, I felt the novelty wore off. And uh, I, I, there are other efficiency heroes that I'd much prefer. And indeed... Most standard worker placement games fit that bill as it is. Because again, I prefer the arc of the game. I like games to have a bit of an arc for things to expand rather than contract, to feel like the universe is growing as opposed to shrinking. And again, novel idea, but I think it mostly serves to highlight why the traditional approaches are superior. Agreed. And that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. We are available on a variety of social meds and other venues. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in. We appreciate you deciding to spend some time with us, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicken. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.